Thank you guys so much for tuning in tonight to our live stream. Make sure to check out our website for information on the upcoming events that we have. One that we wanted to tell you from the very beginning is that next week we will be having a baptism service after Saturday, after Saturday night. You can still get baptized if you want to. Contact the church office um, or you can live stream that event as well. But thank you so much for joining. How are we doing? Well, welcome. Whether you are here at church, at home, at Winco, doing your grocery shopping and watching on your phone, we're glad you're with us and we're excited to worship with you tonight. So let's stand as we sing our Lord's praises. I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in awe on the one who gave it all. I'll stand my soul, Lord, to you surrender all I am is yours. I'll stand with arms
have I overcome by the power of his blood? Amen.
name of all names And nothing can stand against I choose to praise To glorify, glorify the name of all names And nothing can stand against Yes, I will lift you high In the lowest valley You know, a lot of the uh, most epic stories in life begin with a yes or no question. Will you accept a job offer? Uh, Do you take this person to be your husband or your wife? Bilbo Baggins, will you travel to the Lonely Mountain to defeat the dragon in The Hobbit? Um, A few... Or recently, if you're part of one of our Bible studies here at church, and, and if you're not, I would encourage you to join one of our home group Bible studies. They're amazing. But we heard of the story of Matthew, the tax collector, who he had the same yes or no question presented to him. When Jesus showed up and said, Matthew, will you follow me? And Matthew was a guy who, if you know the story, the people around him would say, this guy has it nothing to do with God. They're not even in the same sentence, right? But Jesus shows up, offers that invitation, and Matthew jumps at the chance. He says yes. And if you've chosen to follow God and and to be a part of that journey and say yes to God, what you know, what I know, what Matthew found out is that it's not always easy. That first yes is amazing, but then there's going to be times where we're faced with yes or no again. That's when when trial comes, when it feels like everything is against us, when we're facing a mountain and we just don't see a way around it. And God says in that moment, will you trust me? Will you still praise my name when things are hard? And I love the line of this song that we just sang because I think, I think that's what they were trying to capture in this. When they say, in the waiting, the same God who's never late is working all things out. Because we have this God who, he's never late. It might not be our timing, it might not be my timing or yours, but he shows up at the right timing. And he works everything out to our good if we can say yes to trusting him. So if that's where you're at tonight, if you are, if you're in a place where you just can't see your way around an obstacle, I would encourage you to hold on to the promise of that song to say, yes, God, I will praise you in the lowest valley that I'm in. I will still bless your name. I'm gonna choose to worship you because you're a great God and I know that you will rescue me in the right time, in your timing. Let's continue to praise the name of our great God tonight. So we pull- 
Jesus will return and he will fix all of the brokenness all the hurt that's in our world Jesus is going to make that right we can't wait for that day but in the meantime Father help us to live a life that is worthy of you worthy of our calling that is in hope of your son's return help us to live every day with the hope and the knowledge that Jesus is coming soon. Help us to look forward to that. God, we're excited. How great the 
pain of searing loss the father turned his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory one church in two different locations, and it's been a little bit, we figured there was a few events that have happened that you might not be aware of. So this is kind of our state of the congregation address, just to encourage you with some awesome things that have happened. Number one, did you know that we have started a Spanish-speaking church plant in our building that meets over there, and they are doing quite well? We're very excited about that. Did you know that we have the first indoor baptism in months happening next week in this building after this service. So if you would like to be baptized, it's not too late. You can contact the church office or you can text FBC Dunk to 94000. We thought we were very clever. 
Did you know that if you look at the stones in that jar, there are 749 of them, including the other jar that are over there. If you don't know what that jar is, we put that in a few months ago so that if something happened in your life where you, you knew God came through in a big way, you could come up and in an expression of worship, place a stone in the jar. I put three of them in there this last week. One was for my wife who had surgery on a wisdom tooth and it went very well, I was excited. And my sister had hernia surgery. And you're like, Tyler, that's two, that's not three. I put one in for each hernia. So, and he did really, really well. So the, this is, we counted up 749 tangible expressions of God loving you and working in your life. So there was that. Did you know that 42 individuals signed up for the Discovering First class? That's our class that's leading to membership. So through COVID, 42 different people have said, we want to make this our home church. And we are very excited about that. Thank you. Did you know, I'm not done, there's so many more. Did you know that this weekend right now at Seacrest, there are 27 young men that are being led by Caleb Ivanitsky and his team to learn how to become a man that follows after God's heart. 27 high school guys are over at Seacrest. And the previous weekend, 22 young ladies were doing the same thing. Now, whenever a guy's retreat beats a girl's retreat in attendance, that deserves clapping. Thank you. Come on. And last night in this building and the other one, there were 91 junior high students that were going through their retreat here and two of them accepted Jesus. So we thank God for all of that. Now with all that good stuff, let's get into the word. So open your Bible, please. We're gonna be in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Verses one through seven. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but I do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all the mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but I don't have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. And it is kind. It doesn't envy and it doesn't boast. It is not proud. It doesn't dishonor others and it is not self seeking. It is not easily angered and it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Wow, that was good news. Well, I I put in four. One for each of my hernias. You say, seriously? Yeah. In our family, our motto is, if you haven't had a hernia, you ain't nothing. So I'm leading the way. I mean, got to be about something. All right. Well, welcome to each of you. Uh, both here and online, and we're glad you're here in the middle of this series that we are talking about what matters most. And where do we get that from? It's Paul when he says, and now I want to show you the most excellent way. Tonight, we want to focus on that little phrase about record keeping. So if you're a type C, kind of an accountant, kind of an individual tonight, this is your night. If you're a, a banker, if you're a financier, if you're a person with the gift of administration, this is your night because this is what the passage talks about. Because he says something about in this issue of anger, love is not easily angered. And here's the line, and it keeps no record of wrongs. One of my favorite guys in the Bible is David. Uh, I, I'm quite aware that he had some really good days and he had some really bad days. David was amazing. Leadership, trust of God, Goliath, not a problem. You stand in the middle or in the way of God's promise. Ah, he was courageous, patient. In many ways, he was. He was anointed king, and he didn't actually take possession of that for 10 years. And he ran for his entire life during that time. He was running all over the place. Worshiper, 
I, I find it hard to imagine a person with a more developed theology of worship than David. Warrior, yes. And another reason I like him is because God said he's a man after my own heart, and yet God made sure we saw that David had some difficult seasons in his life. One of them happened to be when his son Absalom, who followed him, took over the kingdom in kind of a revolutionary kind of capacity. And rather than stand up to him and split the entire kingdom, which many encouraged him to do so, David left town. And when he left town, he made his way out of town. And there was an individual uh, guy that was along the side of the road. Shammai. And he was just sitting there when David was making his way out. And Shammai was, was heckling, kind of mocking David. One of his soldiers said, would you like me to run that guy through with a spear? And David looked at him and said, no, leave him alone. Maybe on this day, this is what I deserve. You look at that and you think, wow. That is kindness. Fast forward 10 years from that moment. David is towards the end of his life. And he says to one of his soldiers, remember Shammai of Gera, the Benjamite from Baharim? Do you remember him? Yes. And towards the end of his life, this was David's last words. Do not consider him innocent. Bring his gray head down to the grave in blood. Now, if you fast, go back 10 years, I'm thinking, David, you're one of the most kind and merciful individuals. On a day when you're having your kingdom stripped out of your hands by your son, not God, by your son, and yet on that moment you are patient and kind, and yet 10 years later we know that every day of David's life he thought of that little twerp that was sitting alongside of the road who mocked him on the way out of town. And when he had his opportunity just before he died, said, run the spear through him. Now, that's not exactly a great example of what the text says. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. Paul says that one of the things that's going to mark a Christian, that's going to matter more than anything, is not the ability to keep track of wounds that you've experienced, but the ability to forget them. He, he says in this text, love is not easily angered and it keeps no record of wrong. That's significant because like David, every one of us in this room today has had relationships, wounds, things that have happened to us. Sometimes in relationship to God, we feel disappointed in God. We feel disappointed in the body of Christ. And we've had relationships that are painful. It's one of the reasons why I like David. It's because he's a real person and he's had real things happen to him just like you. But he teaches us an important lesson that Paul is trying to affirm here for good reason and we'll see in a minute why. He said, love keeps no record of wrongs. It's an accounting term. It is. And it's a resentment where you are placing in a ledger a debit with a person's name next to it. Now, good accountants, and we have a phenomenal bookkeeper accountant at our church, Mary. She's remarkable. And, and I have more than a few times asked her, can you go back and get this? And boom, she can nail it down to the day, down to the penny. She has it all. It's right there. It's accessible to her. She knows where the dollar went and she knows who spent it. You see, what Paul is saying is, is, well, if you're going to be a good Christian and you're going to be an accountant, you have to choose to have a bad memory. Why? Because when you write it down, it takes root in your heart. How do I know that? 
David and a thousand other experiences, including probably some of yours. If you write it down, if you mark it somehow, if you know the date, if there's an anniversary and you have begun to put it into the calendar and the rhythm of your heart and your mind, it goes and it takes root. And when you keep record of it, you nurse it. David had to have. For 10 years, he remembered that commoner who sat outside his city and mocked him. On that day when he left town, he looked noble, he looked forgiving, and yet he never forgot it. Not in 10 years, he didn't. And when he had the opportunity, he went back on his day of grace and he said, take his head. How did he do that? For 10 years, he was nursing that. 10 years, he was running that day through his mind. 10 years, those words that that guy spoke to him was going through his mind and he hadn't forgot it. J. Adams, who was a counselor, was talking about a couple who came in and the struggle in their marriage was the mother-in-law and this, this lady was struggling with her mother-in-law and Jay said, what, what's the problem? And she pulled out this long list of everything that she had ever done to her. And Jay said, you're a very good accountant. You're just not a very good Christian. You're a very good accountant. You're just not a great Christian. Why? Because it's exactly what the scripture says. Love keeps no record of wrong. It doesn't write it down. Why? Because when resentment takes root in your heart, it begins to destroy all of your relationships. It does. You see, resentment, and it's true in David's life, it doesn't just stay compartmentalized. It never does. It begins to leak out and begins to create kind of this emotional suicide. What does it look like? Well, a person begins to withdraw and they become vengeful and they become vengeful, first of all, in their mind. Have you ever had one of those relationships? I've had them where I have multiple conversations with that person. I don't know about you, but every conversation I have with a person that I'm angry at, I win. And I sound terribly logical and wonderfully filled with the wisdom of God. But at the end of the day, I win. Why? Because that resentment is stirring in my heart and I'm having that conversation that goes over and over and over again. You withdraw, you become vengeful, you're often joyless, you become negative, and at the core of it, you're bitter. A number of years ago, there was a gentleman who came into my office, actually the husband and the wife. His credit card that he got, apart from his wife, betrayed him when the bill came. And he had some bad purchases in places where married or non-married men should not go. His wife was furious, as she should have been. She couldn't get over it. It festered. And it festered, and it festered. She left him. They got a divorce. He hit rock bottom and repented. He did. He genuinely came to Christ and met the one who forgives all. She became resentful. She became angry. Oh, she was angry at her husband and then she got angry at the church and she got angry at her friends and she got angry at his friends because they didn't hold him accountable. And she kind of confronted his Bible study leader because his Bible study leader should have known, after all, he is omniscient like God, right? All Bible study leaders are. And, and he should have known. And she just started going down the charts. And you know, as maybe you've experienced this, it never stops horizontally. She started going vertically. Last I knew of her, she had gone through multiple men, never once again getting married, became hard, promiscuous, and destroyed. Why? He was the one who sinned because she's the one who kept a record of wrong. 
She was the one who was an incredible accountant. And she knew every sin that her husband had committed. And she knew the dollar amount that he put on that credit card. And she had measured the dollar amount that he spent and what they could have done in their home and how he had betrayed her. And everything became what? A notation in the ledger of her heart. It's really tragic. It is. Because what was his sin was forgiven by God. And what became her sin destroyed her. That's why Paul says, love keeps no record of wrong. My friend, Paul's exhortation, if you can hear this, is not really first and foremost for the person that you're going to love and forgive. It's for you. Maybe the most important thing in the issue of forgiveness is that you realize that when you release a person from whatever they have done to wound you, you first and foremost open the prison of your own rage. Martin Luther's wife came down to him one day and she walked into the house and she was all dressed in black, top to bottom. Martin Luther looked at her and said, who died? And she looks at Martin Luther and she goes, God did. Martin Luther, you know, the great translator of the Bible, the the one who nailed the 95th thesis on the door, the, the great father of all Protestant work, that Martin Luther who, yes, had bouts of depression, and he was in one of those bouts of depression. Who died? God died. He looks up at her and he said, God didn't die. And then she wonderfully looks back at him and says, then act like it. Act like it. You're wallowing in the wounds and what people have said about you. You're wallowing. If God's not dead, then quit acting that way. Why? Because when resentment takes root in your heart, it destroys all of your relationships. So Paul says, love is not easily anchored. It keeps no record of wrong. So what do we do? Number one. You choose the pathway of forgiveness. And how do you do that? You choose to not remember. You choose. See, if you look down through all of these texts, love doesn't do this, love doesn't do this. Not one of them is how do you feel. It's a choice. Love doesn't do this. Love chooses to be kind. Love chooses to be patient. It's a verb. Love chooses to what? Forget. And what you do is you choose to not go over and over. When I was a little kid, and I was never a good speller, I I wanted to be a good speller. When I was a teacher, it was embarrassing not to be a good speller. As a pastor, I don't know why, I don't care. But I still wish I was a good speller, but I'm not. And when I hear people that are really good spellers, my wife is a great speller. She can spell where I ask her all the time, honey, how do you spell much? And she looks at me like, what? I don't know, it seems weird to Day. That's why I like Brian Regan. This is one of my favorite guys. How do you spell cat? K A T. You have to watch it. It's hilarious. <laughs> Just hilarious. But the reality is, we, when I was a kid, man, I knew I was not a good speller. So I'd go over the words and over the words and over the words. I love scripture memory. I do. Every day, unless I'm just sicker than a dog, and I don't know where that came from because dogs usually aren't sick, but the reality is almost every day I go over and over and again, and I have this wonderful app that tells me, you have to repeat this one every week and every two. It's marvelous. Why do I do that? Because I want that scripture in my head, and the only way I can do it is to go over it and over it and over it and over it again. And what he says is don't do that with your wounds. Don't do that with how somebody hurt you. Don't do that with your ex-husband who betrayed you. Don't go over that night. Don't go over that event. More than, 
more than I care to tell you. Sometimes when husbands and wives have affairs or difficult things happen, they want to know all of the details, in particular ladies. And this is not a slam on you. This is just my experience. Ladies more want to know all of the events. Where did it happen? What happened? And they want to know. I take them, I pause and say, can I go talk with you? Do you want every one of these details in your mind? And by the way, what are you going to do with it? I'm not talking about leverage against the person. I am talking about, will you get all of the details in your head and will you go over it and over it and over it and over it again and never release it? Be careful of your insatiable passion to know every detail of a person who's hurt you. It may not be really good for you. It may be better that you live in just a little level of naivety and lack of knowledge. Why? Because Paul says love keeps no record of wrong. It doesn't put it in the ledger. It's not a feeling. It's a command. It's not how I feel today. It's whether or not I choose to be obedient. And that's where we all have to begin. It's not easy. I'm not talking about somebody who cuts you off in the road. I'm talking about somebody who's wounded you deeply, cut your heart open, betrayed you, gone back on their word. Choose not to remember. Secondly, be willing to hand over vengeance to God. Romans chapter 12 says... Don't repay evil for evil. Give God room to take care of vengeance. God is loving. God's merciful. Every one of us have experienced that. And I don't say this to fuel your rage, but God is also just. God has good memory. And my friends, be at peace. God doesn't let people get away with their junk. One of the guys that I, over my lifetime, Dr. Vernon Grounds, had such a privilege of knowing. He was one of the, one of the presidents for Denver Seminary. He, he was one of the most gracious individuals in the world. Brilliant in so many ways. I get to pray with him when uh, those years that I was in Denver. I get to pray with him every Thursday morning. And he was, he was a brilliant missiologist. But maybe what he did best was forgive people, love people. Back in the 50s, if you remember what was happening in some of the Baptistic circles, there was a group of what we call fundamentalists. And let me tell you what, there was no one pure enough for them. They weren't. They were a tough group of people. They would picket Dr. Grounds at Denver Seminary because he didn't come out of the right seminary and he didn't have the right degree. His PhD was in psychology. And this man was just the the, the most grounded, solid, loving God, loving the word of God. But, you know, sometimes people get this idea that if you aren't in their kind of, you know, if you don't walk the way they walk and went to the school that they're supposed to go to, and they, they boycotted him, they picketed him, they put... All kinds of garbage. They put sugar in his gas tank. I mean, they did everything to that guy for 10, 15 years. And he never once spoke out against them. Another dear friend of mine, both of them now in heaven, Dr. Haddon Robinson, was telling me one time of a trip he took to Florida. And there was a gentleman who came where Dr. Robinson was speaking and he came up to him and he said, you know, you're not Dr. Grounds, but somehow being the president of Denver Seminary, I feel like if I confess to you, it somehow helps. I lived in Denver back in the 50s and those were some of the darkest days of my Christian life. I was one of the pastors who continually heckled Vernon Grounds. 
He said, I have lived with regret, regret of that all my life. And then he finished with this statement. Can I tell you about all the men who were with me who stood up against Dr. Grounds? Hadn't asked him, said, um, why do I need to know this? He said, because the church needs to know it when you preach. When God says vengeance is mine, he means it. And this gentleman went on to tell Dr. Robinson of all the men who stood with him to mock, to picket, to put sugar. He said every one of them died under the judgment of God's hand. When the scripture says the faithless will be repaid for their ways and the good man rewarded for his, it's true. And when God says, I will bring my wrath against those who come against the righteous, God means that as well. And my friends, that's why God says, love keeps no record of wrongs. I'll tell you why because it breaks you out of prison and it keeps you from inciting the discipline of God on your life. As Dr. Robinson told me, he goes, I'm not the judge, but he said, I tell you, I walked away from that conversation all the more willing to forgive any who have ever sinned against me. Because when you keep that record, when you take up that offense, when you begin to rehearse against that person, you take out of the hand of God vengeance, but it destroys you, it poisons you, as it did those men. Haddon was amazed to hear man after man after man who died early and some of them even gruesome. Choose not to remember and realize that you and I need to hand over to God the vengeance that we might want to pick up against people. And maybe most importantly, if I'm going to really love people and keep no record of wrong, I got to remember how God has forgiven me. Hebrews chapter 6 says, God will not forget the good works that you have shown towards your people. He does not and will not treat us according to our sins. Colossians chapter 3 verses 12 says, Therefore, as God's dearly loved children, clothe yourselves with kindness and gentleness and, and all of these things and forgive each other as Christ has forgiven you. Whenever I struggle with forgiveness, I always just have a little chat with God. Would you help me have a little bit of reality therapy right now? For some reason, my forgiveness with you is escaping my notice. When I take up and I want to have a conversation. I want somebody to crawl back groveling to me. I want somebody to own what they have done. Whenever that happens, I, I just always have a little conversation with the Father and say, Father, would you help remind me of the many times that you've needed to forgive me? Because somehow, if you can help remind me of that, it triggers my forgiveness towards other people. The scripture says, as far as the east is from the west, so far as God removed our sins. Does God forget them? Uh, to be quite honest with you, no, I don't think he does. If that's the case, then he wouldn't have remembered David's sin. He wouldn't put it in the Bible. It's not that God forgets in the sense that he does, has no record of it. It's that he doesn't hold it against us. And as far as east is from the west, in fact, I was a kid. I used to think, well, man, if you just keep traveling east, you're going to run into west. But it's not true. If you keep going east, you're going to run into what? The infinity and no end. It's going to go forever. 
And if you go true west, the same thing will happen. And what God is saying is, as far as east is from the west, so far I have removed that guilt, I have removed that shame, I have removed of all of the weight of that sin against you. Oh, dear Mark, might you find the ability through the grace of Christ to forgive this poor person who has sinned against you. Joseph, treated horribly by his brothers, sold into slavery, and then he sees them. And he's filled with love and forgiveness. Corey Tenboom, abused, family members murdered. And then she's confronted face to face with the man who did much of that. And she forgave him. Why? Love keeps no record of wrongs. It doesn't put it in the ledger, it chooses. It's not a feeling, it's a choice of obedience because you understand that if I don't forgive, I will imprison myself in the resentment and the anger and the poison that will destroy every other relationship that I have. Paul Stevens, his daughter was stabbed by a neighbor in Evansville, Indiana. He was filled with rage. It wasn't enough that he was caught. It wasn't enough that he was put into prison. Paul would drive into his neighborhood and he would rehearse trying to get to the man and murder him for taking his daughter. It got so much into his psyche that Paul had to take his family and moved. And then he discovered the horrific reality that moving out of Indiana wasn't far enough. We moved all the way to Kentucky, but it wasn't far enough. The stain and the anger and the rage, it cycled over and over and over, and his hatred began to change his very personality. His wife said that he became literally a different person. That's what rage and anger does to you. It's what unforgiveness does. That's why Paul says, love keeps no record of wrongs. It's not just because you're going to release somebody else. It's because you release yourself. Paul went to a retreat, a guy's retreat. And it was there he discovered this very simple truth. Hatred had no ability to restore his daughter's life. It may seem like a small statement. To him, it was a miracle. Hatred had no ability to restore his daughter's life. And so Paul went home from that retreat and he made a decision. God, somehow, I have to work counterintuitively against my flesh. So he went to a local prison. And he asked permission over time as he developed their trust of him to meet with the most violent of criminals in that prison in Kentucky. Twice a week he went. It didn't take him very long until Paul had 24 new friends. Some called him dad. Some called him brother. Many of them called him mentor. He led them to Christ. He discipled them. He cared for them. My friends, if Paul Stevens can face down the dragon of hatred and release it, if Corey Ten Boom can face the man who abused her and murdered some of her family, and if Joseph can look his brothers in the eye and welcome them, you can do it. You can do it. You can choose tonight. I am going to release someone. 
I'm going to release this event. I'm going to release this identity. And I'm no longer going to let it control me. Love keeps no record of wrongs. And my friend, because Christ is in you, you can do it. You can do it. And you will never be more free. And who knows of the beauty of how God will lead you. Maybe a story like Paul. Back into the very place of the kind of men who violated his daughter. And there he became their daddy. You can do it because Christ is in you. Lord Jesus, on the way home tonight, for those of us who have things to release, might this be a journey of transformation. When we wake up tomorrow and we have a busy day, might it be a new day of hope because Christ, you're in us and love keeps no record of wrong. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. And it's in your life we hope. Amen. Sure is good to see you. It is really good to see you. For those of you online, we love you. God bless you.